Hello everyone, and welcome back to the final episode of Season 4 of the History of Africa. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, Madagascar's Prime Minister, Rainila Erifuni, made one final desperate attempt to improve his country's long-standing economic crisis through selling off the country's natural resources. A final Hail Mary which, while at first promising, ultimately ended in failure. The Malgasy government's hold on the island and its economy were becoming increasingly tenuous, just as the main colonial threat to the island was becoming more apparent than ever. Welcome everyone to the end of Season 4, as the French Empire acts to extinguish the independence of the Merina Kingdom, and we enter a new era of Malgasy history. Season 4, Episode 29, The Final Fall of the Twelve Hills. Following the inconclusive end of the French invasion of 1885, Prime Minister Raini Lairifuni had long known that his country's independence was hanging by a thin silk thread. French officials were becoming ever more brazen in their expansionist ambitions, while his own grasp on power on the island was becoming ever more loose. His attempts to reinvigorate the economy through foreign investment had failed tremendously, and the country's armory was still depleted of ammunition since the last war with France had concluded. The final years of the Kingdom of Madagascar were an atmosphere of understandable defeatism. While Raini Lairifuni, of course, didn't publicly admit anything as such, it's hard to imagine that a man like himself didn't see the writing on the wall. He had thrown everything his kingdom had at stopping France last time. The next invasion was something that they couldn't possibly halt. The sole hope remaining for Malagasy independence was the ever-hazardous world of international diplomacy. Raini Lairifuni had worked hard to cultivate a close relationship between his island kingdom and another, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland. While they had refused to directly intervene in France's last invasion, it was a well-known fact that Britain at least had a token opposition towards French aggression toward the island. When France had tried to impose protectorate status on Madagascar following the war, Britain, as much as Madagascar, chose to ignore this French claim, and kept up direct diplomatic correspondence despite French howls of anger. Even following the French invasion, the British Foreign Secretary continued to insist that Britain and France already had an understanding that Madagascar would remain independent. Despite this, the French remained optimistic that the British were, at worst, a temporary setback to French ambitions in Madagascar. Particularly, recent developments in the 1880s ensured that European expansion in Africa more generally would be easier and more cooperative than ever before. Now, I've talked about this in the last chapters of our final season, but one of the biggest myths surrounding the history of colonization in Africa relates to the infamous Berlin Conference of 1884. See, in 1884, provoked by the unprecedented rapidness of Belgian expansion in the Congo, 13 European powers in the United States convened in Berlin to discuss the future of colonialism in Africa. Pop histories, and in some cases, respectable historians who don't focus on Africa working outside of their expertise, often make the mistake of depicting the 1884 conference as the birthplace of the scramble for Africa. A term that is so overused to the point of being cliché is that the Berlin Conference carved up Africa, a term usually accompanied by your high school social studies teacher bringing up a PowerPoint slide depicting a cartoon of the German Kaiser cutting up a cake labeled Afrique. I'll be posting it on the blog, and I'm sure to many people it will be a very familiar sight. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this here, and I think I said the same thing last time, but this characterization is pretty misleading. For starters, the Berlin Conference did not, quote-unquote, carve up anything. European armies, followed by colonial administrators in their wake, did. The Berlin Conference was intended to merely act as a general guidebook an agreement which the attendees vaguely consented to follow and obey, but which they usually didn't. Don't get me wrong, the conference in Berlin was a pretty big deal and certainly a historical event worth noting. I mean, there's a reason why it comes up here, but it wasn't exactly the era-defining event it's often characterized as. One of the biggest failures of this Berlin conference-centered view of colonialism in Africa is how much it underplayed the agreements which truly set the rules of colonial expansion a complex network of bilateral treaties and compacts between any two colonizing powers. And in 1890, six years after the Berlin Conference had supposedly already divided up the continent, the British government still had plenty of disputes to negotiate, of which French claims on Madagascar were just one of dozens. 
Again, really not trying to get too far into it, but another one of these earlier disputes that took place in 1890 was between the British and German government. See, the Berlin Conference had not specified which European powers could make claims to East Africa, only vaguely stating that basically the entire coast of modern Tanzania and Kenya was under British influence. However, this agreement was just words on paper, ones which didn't stop German colonial companies from entering the region, coercing local nobles and villages into signing away their sovereignty, and creating a major German colony in East Africa. Particularly contentious was the German aim to expand this colony over the island of Zanzibar. Britain had long valued Zanzibar as a secure center of commerce in the region, and had often regarded the Sultanate on the island as an informal British protectorate. So, the British strongly objected to German claims over the island, fearing that they would lose influence on the important commercial center. Ultimately, this dispute spiraled out of control into a whole mess of territorial disputes between not only Germany and Britain, but many others. In 1890, the two states ultimately came to an agreement over the Zanzibar dispute. Britain would invade Zanzibar and turn it from an informal protectorate into a formal protectorate. In exchange for the Germans conceding their claim on Zanzibar, the British, too, would concede some claims as well, recognizing German control over Namibia, Togo, and, strangely enough, an archipelago off the German coast that the British had long owned. Now, I get that that was a lot, so here's the part that matters to Madagascar. To the French and Malagasy governments, they had just witnessed Britain sign away mainland Tanzania, a region which they had previously staunchly claimed as in their own sphere. For the French, this provided hope that, with the right terms, the British would similarly sign away their recognition of Madagascar. For Malagasy and Rainilai Rifuni, it represented a final British betrayal. Only a month after the signing of the Anglo-German Compact, the French opted for an equivalent of their own. The French Foreign Office feigned offense over the British protectorate of Zanzibar. After all, they had not been consulted on the matter, and they still recognized the Sultan of Zanzibar as an independent actor. This was clearly something worth disputing and discussing further, and if the British didn't concede, then they would start setting up their own independent embassies on Zanzibar. The British, seeing the obvious French intention behind this complaint and wanting to avoid France undoing their fragile treaty with Germany, gave in and started negotiating. In exchange for French recognition over a British protectorate of Zanzibar, the British recognized the French protectorate over Madagascar. In one cruel twist of Machiavellian geopolitics, the decades-long relationship cultivated by Raini Lairifuni was dead. For the last time, an independent Madagascar felt the sting of Britain turning its back on them. And almost immediately following the agreement, rumblings of war began to emanate from the French government. The French already had an easy justification for their invasion, enforcing their newly recognized protectorate status over Madagascar. Remember, at the end of the previous French invasion of Madagascar, the French had insisted that their treaty gave them exclusive protectorate status over Madagascar. This had not been the case on the ground, neither Madagascar nor most other European colonial powers had recognized the treaty as such. However, with Britain's concession of the French protectorate over Madagascar, the island country was now on its own in trying to reinforce its interpretation of the treaty. The French, on the other hand, were now eager to enforce the French protectorate through force of arms. Making this the case, though, was not necessarily easy. Remember, France had tried to impose such a status on Madagascar in the First War, and had failed. What would stop this invasion from ending in similar disappointment for the French? Well, a few things had changed since the First War that made the situation far less hazardous for France, and far more threatening for Madagascar. For starters, there was the state of the Malagasy army. The army could still reliably field a decent chunk of men, with French estimates ranging between 25 and 35,000, and they did still have a decently up-to-date stock of locally made rifles, and even 50 European modern artillery units. Many of the officers in the Malagasy army were still the same professional and well-drilled men that had fought in the last war, and had imparted this training on the levies that they commanded. But all these factors were outweighed by one tremendous problem facing the Marina army, and that was ammunition. Ammunition shortages had prevented the Marina from achieving a substantial victory in the last war, and had only grown more severe since then. The significance of this shortage cannot be overstated. 
as it would prevent Medina soldiers from launching any significant or prolonged attack against French forces, allowing only short probing skirmishes at most, and even those were risky and potential wastes of precious resources. Having learned their lesson from the last conflict, the French Ministry of War opted to take a more careful and planned approach to the next invasion. There were a number of obstacles that they would have to keep in mind, and the Merina sought to use them as an advantage. For starters, Imerina was like a castle with a moat. The interior mountains of the island were a tough, easily fortified area, one with plenty of food and resources that Malagasy defenders could use to hold out against French attacks. Meanwhile, the coastal regions of the island were a moat, a treacherous, inhospitable land, a potential death trap for an invading army, featuring poor infrastructure. The best case scenario for the Malagasy kingdom was, well, basically a repeat of the previous invasion. French troops could capture some coastal objectives, but ultimately get turned back when they tried to move further inland, being forced to suffer from the attrition of an incredibly hostile climate as they recovered. The French, meanwhile, would seek to avoid this outcome at all costs. In an effort to mitigate supply shortages on the coast of the island, the French would use a type of metal cart developed from previous colonial ventures in West Africa and Vietnam, which would make it far easier to transport supplies over the poor coastal infrastructure. Furthermore, the French wanted to ensure that only the best quality French troops were used on the mission. The commander of the French expedition, a general named Mercier, required that all soldiers on the expedition had more than a year of active combat experience, that they had strong service records, and that they were solely volunteers, no conscripts allowed. Ultimately, the result was impressive, an almost 15,000-man army equipped of the best available French arms. The main force was comprised primarily of Algerian soldiers, with a sizable minority of French and Hausa soldiers from the French colony in Niger. The unit also packed supplies to receive fresh volunteers in Réunion, as well as anti-Merina elements within Madagascar itself. And as if that wasn't enough, the French came prepared for the poor infrastructure of the coastal regions, enlisting 800 engineers to clear forests, as well as over 1,000 Senegalese baggage carriers, to ensure a well-stocked supply chain. In total numbers, the French invasion force numbered over 18,000 men. The French landed the bulk of their forces in Mahajanga, with a plan of following the Betsy Boca and Icopa rivers directly into Antanarifu. The local garrison, knowing that they could not mount serious resistance of their own, immediately fled to the highlands and conceded the city. It became apparent that the French were correct to provide equipment for local allies. The reports that the Sakalafa people were ready and willing to align with the Marina's enemies had been, if anything, an understatement. Mahajanga and its surroundings had always been an area of tenuous Marina authority, and Raini Lairifuni's government had particularly done a lot to alienate the city's population in recent times. His centralization reforms had taken a great deal of power and autonomy away from local Sakalav nobility in favor of Merina military bureaucrats. This resentment had only gotten worse following the Merina court's conversion to Christianity, and especially after the reimposition of Fanampuana. While there had been a sizable Christian population in the highlands, a region where missionaries had been remarkably active, the religion was largely unknown in Mahajanga. As the Merina government gradually stopped performing sacred rites and began to actively persecute local Sampie guardians, the already bubbling Sakalava anger had steadily grown more severe. After decades of bubbling resentment, the Sakalava anger against the Merina finally had the opportunity to manifest as French troops landed in Mahajanga. Sakalava mobs began to rejoice with gleeful rage, lynching and torturing Merina civilian settlers and their former bureaucratic overlords all the same. The French typically allowed and actively encouraged this violence, in the hopes that this vengeful energy could also result in increased recruitment. This would prove successful, as thousands of Sakalava would sign up for the French army, donning red fezes and taking up arms against the army of Raini Lairifuni. The French northern army began to slowly crawl its way south, encountering heavier Merina resistance as they moved further inland. Meanwhile, the crippling ammunition shortage facing Raini Lairifuni's army was forcing him into a defensive position. This position was made all the more pressing when, in December of 1894, a second, smaller French army landed in Tuamasina. Unlike Mahajanga, the Tuamasina landing was fiercely resisted. Raini Lairifuni knew that if Madagascar was ever going to receive arms or ammunition from international weapons dealers, 
that they would come through the port of Tuamasina. Holding some presence on the harbor would therefore be vital to the Manina war effort. The Manina managed to set up a strong defensive perimeter between two palisades on the main path away from the port, successfully halting the French advance. But no such success could be reported on the northern front. The main French force continued to make slow but steady progress down the Betsy Boca. Raini Lairifuni had instructed his armies to take a flexible and careful approach when defending an area, entrenching themselves heavily prior to battle, but being willing to retreat at the first sign that the defenses were likely to be overwhelmed. The army also adopted a scorched earth policy, destroying local sources of provisions upon making their retreat. After six months of careful and meticulous advance, the French and Malagasy had still yet to fight a major battle on the northern front. With the exception of the stalemate of Tomasina, essentially every battle in the war had taken a similar narrative direction. The French meet a Malagasy entrenched position upon their path, the two exchange fire for a few days, before the French spent a few days finding an alternative route to flank the defensive position and the Malagasy retreated. Meanwhile, Raini Lairifuni's Fabian tactics of only minimally engaging the French were seemingly taking a toll. As he had hoped, a lack of medical preparedness began to take its toll on the French army, with heavy medical casualties beginning to set in. Regardless, the tactic of avoiding prolonged confrontation couldn't last forever. By late September of 1895, the French had reached the foothills of Imanina. In the clearer highlands, with better infrastructure and a more temperate climate, the French army was able to quicken its advance considerably. Raini Lairifuni knew that if he didn't confront the French, they would soon be at the gates of Antanarifu itself. About 80 kilometers west of Antanarifu, outside a small village called Sabutsie, Raini Lairifuni decided to mount his final stand. The Menina army began constructing crenellated earthworks along the ridges of the hills surrounding the village. Meanwhile, a small force of Hofa soldiers waited within the village itself, forcing the French into tough house-by-house -house fighting, while taking losses from hilltop gunfire. The French, meanwhile, were surprised when the Malagasy didn't abandon the positions as they got closer. What they didn't know is that this was not to be yet another quick skirmish, but a climactic effort to stop the French advance. As the French advanced towards the village positions, a Malagasy howitzer fired a shot in the air, its echoing boom giving the signal to attack. The French, caught off guard by the first major attack they suffered throughout the war, lost six men in the first seconds of battle. As the French scrambled for cover, the positions within the village itself began to fire on them, killing a French corporal in the process. However, this advantage was short-lived. French mountain guns within their position began to fire and neutralize the hilltop positions leaving the Marina soldiers within the village isolated. Meanwhile, the French's own Sakalava soldiers proved decisive, sprinting up a hill at a breakneck speed to attack the remaining defenders and capturing the Marina artillery positions. The Marina defenders broke out into a retreat, regrouping 80 kilometers east to make their final stand at the capital city itself. Meanwhile, the soldiers continuing to defend Thomasina were similarly ordered to retreat for what would be the true final stand of the war. Now, the capital city was well stocked with supplies, including 30 machine guns captured from France in the previous war, and 7 modern artillery batteries. At the same time, the city's residents desperately scrambled to form defensive positions, creating barricades out of stone, clay, and planks from the city's buildings. Others sought deliverance from a higher power, flocking to the chapel at the Rufa, praying for their safety during the upcoming brutal siege. As the sun set that night, the 29th of September, 1895, Raini Lairifuni himself had to face a tough dilemma. He had ruled this island kingdom for almost three decades now, had rescued it from his brother's chaotic rule, and had paid endless blood, sweat, and tears into preserving its independence. He had sent men as far afield as London and New York in an effort to prevent war, and when that effort failed, he had sent countless men to their graves to halt the French advance. To tens of thousands of formerly enslaved Makoa, Raini Lairifuni was their great liberator, the man who had set them free from bondage, while to others, like the Sakalava of the north or the Betsimi Saraka of the east, he had been their great oppressor, their ultimate enemy. He had overseen the radical economic, political, and religious transformation of his empire into a state that was unrecognizable from that which he had inherited. And now, by the end of the coming siege, all of that would have been for naught, his life work would be over, and his empire would be no more. As the morning of September the 30th arrived, 
the demoralized Manina soldiers prepared for what would surely be the climactic battle in the history of the Manina Empire. They knew that there was little chance of winning, but it would still be a chance that they would need to take. By 7 a.m., the French had launched a series of attacks against the hills surrounding the city, and by 1.30, they had captured the final Malgasi Hill on the rim of Antanarifu. This last hill had featured an observatory, a component of one of Raini Lairifuni's many educational institutions, which he had sponsored to propel his country into the future. Now it had been used as the final site of resistance, the last stand before the terrible siege of Antanarifu could begin. But ultimately, it turned out that Raini Lairifuni and his ministers were not willing to let their people die in some symbolic and pointless blaze of glory. When the French began to advance on the city itself, they fired shots from captured Marina artillery batteries at the royal palace and chapel. As one of the shells collided with the palace, severely damaging its observation decks, a man rose to the top of the building. He was the foreign minister of the kingdom of Madagascar, and he stood atop the palace waving a white flag of surrender. After a lifespan of 350 years, the kingdom of Imerina was no more. The beginning of the colonial era heralded many changes for the island of Madagascar, as well as many challenges for the new French authorities. Raini Lairifuni, as well as other high-ranking bureaucrats in the Marina government, were exiled to Algeria, where they would live out their final years in squalor and obscurity. For the first few years following the capture of the palace in 1895, the French attempted to maintain Nana Falona III as a puppet monarch, placing her under the jurisdiction of a French administrator, but still officially treating her as the sovereign ruler of Madagascar. In reality, the queen had no authority, and colonial rule had arrived, but the French were more than happy at first to maintain the fiction that this was business as usual. But as the French attempted to consolidate their hold over the island, they quickly came to understand the struggles that had faced Raini Lairifoni during his governance. All of the various rebel groups, slave republics, and local monarchs with ambitions of independence were the French administration's problem now. And as if that wasn't chaotic enough, revolts against French colonial rule began to proliferate within Imerina itself. While it would go down in history as the Menelamba, or Red Cloak Uprising, this is a misnomer, as the chaos of early French colonial rule in Madagascar is better understood as a collection of dozens of largely separate and independent rebellions, rather than a single organized revolt, often motivated for different reasons. Particularly in Imerina, though in a few other places throughout the island, the rebellion took a decisively anti-Christian tone, with many peasants throughout Imerina declaring that the royal family's destruction of the Saint-Pierre and adoption of Christianity was the ultimate root of the nation's catastrophic defeat. On the other hand, there were also charismatic Malgasi Christian preachers, who claimed that the Medina kingdom had been defeated because it had not gone far enough in embracing the Christian faith. But for them all, it was a matter of resisting foreign rule. In this case, many of those same Sakalava soldiers who had assisted the French invasion of Imerina put down the red fez of the colonial military and literally or figuratively donned the red cloak of rebellion. Further egging on this rebellion was the French reintroduction of corvée labor to the island, a system which many Malgasi saw as a continuation of the most hated part of Merina rule. Then there were the slave republics, who had never considered themselves under Merina rule to begin with. Of course, they were not just going to lay down their arms because a new enemy had arrived to replace the old one. Regardless, the French would struggle to control Madagascar throughout these early years, even varyingly losing parts of Antanarifu itself, to incessant rebel attacks. Ultimately, the French had to commit significant resources to crushing these rebellions. The French army was notoriously brutal in crushing the Menelamba revolt, often massacring entire villages suspected of supporting rebel groups. The worst of these atrocities took place at Ambiquier, a small Sakalava village of 2,000 people. Ultimately, this entire town's population would be murdered, bayoneted to death in the night. Following a year of brutal suppression, most of the rebels were either killed or scared into submission by French brutality by the end of 1897. Some small pockets of resistance would persist into the 20th century, but for the most part, French colonial rule had truly arrived and was now capable of being fully imposed. But Anna Faluna III, on the other hand, had been viewed with suspicion by the French. While this was likely untrue, the French suspected that she had either intentionally played a role in encouraging the rebellions, or had unintentionally encouraged them by remaining a symbol for the continuity of Menina rule. 
The last queen of Madagascar lived out her final days in exile in the foreign land of Algeria, never to return to her homeland. But the French would soon find out that the Malagasy spirit of independence could not be destroyed with the mere exile of a monarch. Madagascar would see major rebellions break out against French rule throughout the 20th century, with 1905 and especially 1947 seeing particularly fierce resistance against French colonialism. It turned out that even though the Kingdom of Madagascar died that September day in 1895, that the greatest legacy it left behind persists to this day. The dream of Andre Namponi Merina remains true. The rice fields of Madagascar do extend to the sea. Only now, they are no longer the domain of one man. Today, now that Madagascar has regained its independence, it is once again the sovereign land of the Topantani, the people of the nation. Thank you all for joining me on this adventure through the history of Madagascar. This season, uh, like all seasons, took an absurd amount of time, work, research, and energy to produce, so I really hope that paid off for you in the form of an enjoyable show. Anyways, if you did enjoy this season, I highly encourage you to stay with us for our next. At the end of each season, our supporters on Patreon collectively vote on which topic they'd like to see covered within that region. So the voters have chosen, and next season will focus on something which I am personally very excited about. Join us please for the start of our next season, when we travel far back in time to the ancient sands of the Sahara Desert, and uncover the mysterious remains of a civilization that not only survived but thrived, building metropolis in the desert that transformed a wasteland into a paradise. The land of the ancient Garamantes civilization awaits us in our next season. Until then, our next episode will focus on something which the Patreon supporters chose as well. Every 100 supporters we've hit on Patreon is a goal, and this year, we hit our next goal of 200. So in celebration, I decided to let the Patreon supporters choose any topic literally anything that they wanted me to cover, as long as it pertains, of course, to African history. So they chose the topic of our next short mini-series that we'll be going into as we transition to the story of the Garamantes. You might have heard the term Bantu before, referring to the many peoples of South and Central Africa. But just how valid is this term, and where does it come from? And perhaps most importantly, in terms of modern-day archaeology and anthropology, is it still even a useful term for us at all? So please join us for listening to those special episodes where we get into the historiography of the idea of the Bantu expansion and Bantu peoples. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like our show, then we would greatly appreciate if you could help support the show and our project of freely available online history education. You can do this by supporting us at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or iTunes, or by sharing the podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy learning about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Dimitri, Alexander Travis, BB Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Johnny Knowles, Godfrey Sebelavie, Pascal Mococha, Joe Maxwell, Nkechi Nwabudike, Sheuna Laurenti Main, Kwajo Mankwa, Douglas Harder, Craig Bolton, Samuel Badu, Gassan Firgiani, Niti, Kitty, Tariq Beetleman, and Calvin J. Norris, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really, really, really means a lot.